Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of World of All Derivatives. I'm Greg Newman, the CEO of Onyx Capital Group. Today, we've got a different episode. We are going away from kind of specifics in the oil markets prices and that kind of thing to talking about data. So I've got here with me uh, Adam Butler, who runs the team, uh, the data team at Onyx Capital Group and his trusty sidekick, Tom Dyson. <laughs> um, so guys, really, really interested to get stuck into this because uh, yeah, data is obviously a really hot theme. It's now moving towards more AI chat, but all under the same thing, what you guys specialize in, what you've been doing in your careers. Um, so what is data in the context of your career and what it means for kind of what you do and what you have been doing? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, I guess if we start kind of, you know, roll, roll the clock back a little bit, then yeah. uh, um, I started out as a consultant, uh, kind of in, you know, KPMG, um, starting there and then moved across a bit through the team, kind of doing, touching on lots of different bits of technology and through that kind of got more and more into into data. And that was kind of before like, you know, data science and AI machine learning was kind of even like a big common topic, right? It was more about engineering and, and, uh, and movements and BI reporting, this kind of stuff. Um, so it's more absolutely. about the flow of data from yeah, into the technology. Yeah, data in kind of supporting business processes. It was yeah. like extracting value out of the data was quite, um, nuanced and quite mm. limited and certainly wasn't that well not really that interesting it was more data analysis rather mm. than anything you know cool and fun that we kind of associate with it today um so that's kind of done that and across lots of business sectors um as part of that through kind of healthcare and uh public sector stuff and also kind of defense all sorts, all sorts of bits there really but you uh, started off as a, as a physicist yeah before that yeah you started off as a physicist so yeah kind of guess my relationship with data goes even predates that really okay. so yeah we yeah, I started off at CERN really. So, um, kind of working there on kind of experiments there when they won the the Nobel Prize or got the or the call out. That was the you. Nobel Prize. Oh, no, obviously <laughs> wasn't. That was I was in my first few weeks of of, uh, of of working there, and everyone was popping the champagne. And I felt like oh, a nice. bit of an imposter. Yeah, I was oh, like, cool. I've got no claim to any of this, but fine, I'll take a glass. Um, but, but yeah, that's kind of what it's been, and I've seen it kind of develop from um, being very nice. Obviously, as my skills have developed too, kind of gone along and ridden that that wave and that journey. But what, I, I'm interested, how do you get from CERN? How does theoretical physics in CERN lead to data science? As you say, the industry as in the world was hadn't even really created that sector yet. Yeah, but, but I think that's one of the things I, I guess, kind of, you know, the value of, the, of these kind of, I guess, STEM degrees is, is the skill sets and the maths and is actually very similar. It's all kind of differential calculus and mm. that's kind of what underpins all of or all of machine learning and mm. uh, and also the problem solving skills is and you do work with data as part of your degree in, in solving things and proving things and and really kind of digging deep and doing research so that kind of really helps i think really and and makes the transition because so i'm because i'm well, i'm a self-trained effectively self-trained data right. scientist i mean all these all these masters and everything that you get out there now and, and a lot of the guys we have kind of applying to join the team right they they're all kind of done a data science masters or something like that but you know we all had to teach ourselves basically i don't know what what was your yeah similar on. similar stuff i think i did like a slight bit of programming at uni and mm. maybe a little bit of r which is the statistical package but we never really touched it until i kind of found my graduate job and went sort of straight into it and you went straight just, into data science yeah yeah straight from university yeah um i really just it's kind of been teaching myself and like good mentors as well to kind of help you through and point you to but just speaking to someone who obviously doesn't know that you go from differential equations the the mathematics that's involved in theoretical physics or just generally maths mathematics and there's this new kind of concept that's gaining a lot of traction called data science and then people love a buzzword and you say data science to everyone and everyone starts being interested for some reason but the actual definition for you is just maths essentially so when you started your first job it was just provide it was just bringing your mathematical ability to just try and yeah, I think Experiment. It was, it's like the idea that you can kind of learn all the skills that you might need. A lot of data science is just pure programming, right? And mm. if you don't come from kind of a computer science background, you're going to have to be able to learn programming and be able to do sort of analytics and kind of that whole feeding it back to stakeholders, that whole thing. So it's being able to do all of those skills, I suppose. So not putting you on the spot, but what is data science and what is data engineering? Uh, so I guess data engineering would be kind of getting that data from particular sources to a data science of some some sort. And then data science would be analyzing it. That might not necessarily be all the way to machine learning, but quite often it can involve that. And then feeding that kind of back to stakeholders. Yeah, I, I think that's an important distinction that you mentioned, right, is, is that a lot of people think that 
data science is just doing AI in inverted commas if you're listening <laughs> along, right? But it's it's so much more than Can't that. Can't ChatGPT just do that? <laughs> yeah, well, 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 we're, well, it, well more, not talk too far to be honest. It's uh, yeah. it's coming for coming for our jobs too. So, um, yeah, it, it's more than that. It's it's kind of it's manipulating the data. It's um, kind of just doing general analysis and exploration. It's not just hey, slap it in a model and write model dot fit. It's uh, it, it's not that. It's way yeah. way broader than that. There's so many different sub disciplines to 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 it that it's not just train a deep learning model or go write a prompt. But this is what's so interesting to unpack, and we'll say with the journey that we've had, like we'll go go through this. But uh, I guess a nice way to kind of segue into the industry is neither of you are from oil. And when you looked at the oil problem, I guess, or did you, you just had had the interview, essentially, you had the chat with me, Mm -hmm. and then that was your only introduction. So what, I guess, what was your interest in oil from that perspective or was not really about that it's just about the challenge that was presented to you um yeah i think well for me it was kind of it was the challenge and it's um i think working in in or trading in general in in a, in a trading organization there are a lot of challenges and there's a lot of interesting data um to work with and as long as the it's one of those things that i don't i don't really mind too much about the industry as long as there's interesting problems to solve it could be the most dull as dishwater industry out there but if the data's cool and interesting you've got interesting problems to solve with it then mm. It's fine by me. I mean, no yeah. offense to <laughs> dishwater. Yeah. 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 Well, I just, just, for, just to, you know, just to clarify that trading is not dull as dishwater. It's actually yeah. interesting. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. but yeah. it's on its evolution like everything else. And I think um, particularly the oil market, um, data is it just, just like anything, like something gains traction in the macro sense and macro theme and every industry tries to cotton onto it. Right. Yeah. So obviously it was tech, it was a huge thing and then data and then AI now and these kind of things. But, um, when I presented the opportunity to you, Adam, it was, we were still very much in the, I mean, it's only, only recently, right? Only a couple of years ago, but it's, it's uh, the oil market was all about, and still is a lot about the data within supply and demand within the physical world. So ship tracking, uh, applying data science to ship tracking models, um, storage, these kind of things. It, it's not even, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of deep analysis that goes into uh, that kind of data with correlations in the market and the rest of it. But but stage one is very much extracting that data and having as powerful data as you can for the physical things that are going on in the world, the physical oil market, things that are going around the world. So mainly, obviously, uh, logistics, uh, but refinery outputs, all this kind of stuff. And it's gotten very evolved. So I, I say that because, you know, if you'd say I'm joining the as a data scientist in the oil markets, chances are you're working on this kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. You're pulling down like airline traffic, trying to automate, data streams coming from public domains and things like that to maximize your analysis on supply and demand. But what I challenge I was giving you was completely different, right? This is me saying, this is financial oil markets. It's a nascent oil market, uh, sorry, nascent market in some respects. Um, A lot of people know about the futures, but as I bang on about every day, it's we're in the oil swaps market, which is an extension of the oil futures, this sub market and pretty much untouched from a data science perspective, algorithmic perspective. So, how are we going to tackle this challenge? Because it's a huge, huge, huge market, comparable, as you found, comparable open interest to all these huge futures, yet completely untouched. And I guess it was, I knew that we had a strategic, a fantastic strategic position, given the trading we were doing, given our market share as market makers, given how much the market's flow we were seeing. So the challenge was very much, how do we reveal the market's position? How do we provide some predicting power? How do we analyze the markets to create research products to support our trading, to support our services. Very greenfield. And that was the word yeah. that was said about a thousand times. Greenfield, yeah, yeah. greenfield. But that was obviously, I'm assuming that was what attracted to it as well. It's nice to work <laughs> with. Yeah, yeah. Well, for, not, for, not for, for everyone. For, well, yeah, but for, well, I guess that there, there are challenges with, with greenfield yeah. projects, right? Especially something quite so, well, I'm trying to think of a polite term, but so green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so green. Well, um, it was just me trying to figure it out. Yeah, and that's the thing. I'd done everything qualitatively. So I'd said, this is how we think the market's positioned. The traders have said this to me. I've spoken to them all, and this is a view based on this. Mm-hmm. I was like, this has got to be procedural and process driven. Yeah. But I have no clue. So that's what I mean. Obviously, that's how that's how it found you. But that's that's the great place to start, right? So you saw this. You had to learn all about this market, and there's just so many things from there to what it became. But yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, and just to put, passing on that is yeah, it was it's full throttle. Um, yeah. kind of going in the deep end. Um, mm-hmm. with yourself and 
and learning about the markets and and i think really we that was that's really just scratching this and i mean like the the shallowest scratch to the <laughs> surface just to try to keep up with with the stuff that you know you talk how the traders talk you know that there's so much lingo that you probably just yeah, take it's a second new language. And, it's, it's, yeah. and it's it's completely alien um to start with so that's kind of thing if anyone is looking at coming in from a different industry it's like it's wild but um don't worry it's just a lot of fancy words you know everyone likes to make fancy <laughs> words on it but um yeah when when we started it was um it was kind of like yeah like literally paratrooper basically onto the floor onto the onto the deck and and just trying to see what the lay of the land and and try and work out what we were trying to do i mean mm -hmm. obviously you you identified that there was kind of value mm -hmm. to be had here and and an asset um that we just needed to try and get in on top of and a you know, I'm fairly sure you didn't quite understand the level of uh, well, what I what of, I of work that was was. Well, required. do you remember I was analogizing it? Like, I feel like we've got gold underground, yeah, but mm. got no clue how to mine it, yeah, yeah, and to start. Well, that was the best thing. I mean, first, and you know, we're not going to go into a you know thousand you know thousand meter deep gold mine or whatever. But you know, we basically started by digging a hole, mm. right, and all just panning for gold, basically, mm -hmm, right, and. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the, the primary ethos was was whilst we kind of um, stabilized um, and and kind of set that base infrastructure up is like okay but how can we how can we start releasing value initially right because there is there is so much it's such a virgin market that uh, an an area that there is going to be stuff just sitting on the ground like you don't even need to dig for it it's going to mm -hmm. be here you just need to look right you just need to get your metal detector out and, yeah and go for it so that was kind of the first first phase. Um, and, and I guess, you know, it's, it's kind of identifying that the tactical, you know, those short term, you know, panning for gold, but then, okay, whilst we're doing that, let's just not, you know, let's also look at the future and say, okay, where is the bigger picture here? Where is the strategic? So let's provide some context to that because this is the thing is like people say these things, obviously we get the analogy, but as in for the, for the actual market, the first port of call was, I think was, you know, we'd spend hours where I'm basically trying to get you to download what I know and apply your expertise. And there's lo lots of conversation diagrams. And I love doing that with someone like yourself because it's not like you're just a kid that I'm just like talking to and they go, okay, and they're learning a lecture. No, you have all this expertise and you're trying to learn it within the lens of what you know and your expertise. So the conversations that come straight away are so fascinating, but also it's like, you're not, you're not, um, what do you call it? Like uh, you haven't got the issue of not knowing all the, bollocks that people have and yeah. all the assumptions and all the bias and that's yeah. that was half the hypothesis was the market's thinking about supply and demand way too much it's all they ever talk about no one ever challenges this kind of stuff no one's done any of this work in the financial markets mm -hmm. so that was the challenge right so um you weren't you weren't biased by that you weren't yeah um but anyway the first port of call for me i feel was trying to get you to understand the pricing element which is kind of you can understand fine mm -hmm. but how that creates a kind of network you know we yeah, used to call yeah. it the web now we call it a network do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I guess for anyone who's not, who's not familiar, is um, across all these oil swaps, there's well several hundred contracts, right? And they are all pretty much all linked to to a other contract, at least one, if not more. You know, either by differential contracts or various other mechanisms, um, whether they be explicit or implicit. Um, so they kind of form them and we can uh, basically, well, we have plotted them, right? And we have sh shown them and, and how they all correlate together, um, which is kind of one of the the unique things about um, data in, or well, particularly in, in the swaps market is is the explicit links between them all and, and how many there are and how deep it goes. Um, but how they link. But this was the key bit, because if you talk to someone in the industry before, let's say a few years back, they say, oh, this thing that happened this price movement on this contract in propane or whatever the contract is it was yeah because the stocks went down and da 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 yeah, so yeah. Well, how about think of it like a spider's web and i f you know you flick one other end of the web and it has all these vibrations all the way down yeah to the other side yeah exactly i mean it's basically it is exactly like that right it is a web and you can see these ripples that go through but the ripples the sh are shockwaves through it but that's, it's quite a poignant thing to start with that, right? Because it's not, it's like, it's just by doing something in the financial market on one contract creates an impact on a financial contract on another completely different area, mm -hmm. you know, jet fuel or whatever. But where's the fundamental kind of physical relationship? Zero. It was the consequence of financial flows. And that yeah. that's what we really grasped mm -hmm. at the beginning, right? Yeah, yeah. That was, that was kind of the initial thing. And, and I guess it, that in combination with, 
the fact that we can start to put some color on that um, with with the data that kind of we had. And uh, as a market maker, we such like I say, just such significant market share is is we can you know you might run into some some cul de sacs if you if you didn't have it maybe, and it certainly yeah like we say puts a lot of color on on things and one signal you might see um you know you might see price price roofing um in one contract and it might be that it is that there might be something that's happening on that contract um and it might be because you know the market's stockpiling in one way and we kind of see that happening or like you say it could be something that's you know um somewhere else i think there's a, there's a classic example in in the gas net right that you that we talk about, which was nothing to do with who was doing anything on gas now, right? It was it was coming from from way down the chain, mm. um, and it, and it's not until you start to visualize this and really get on top of it um, that you kind of see these patterns. Um, it, it's challenging to work with. Um, I think that's probably one of the primary challenges um, we have. Um, Tommy was obviously worked which with this data quite a lot. Like, you know, how do you how do you find working? you know working with, with these related contracts and kind of doing the exploration as if unless mm. it was you know in comparison to maybe if you're doing something on a futures market where it's just kind of one solid solitary yeah. contract i think from like kind of a, a data science point it's rare that you get so many highly correlated things and it's okay. quite it can be quite difficult with your normal kind of data science project won't you won't have these things all kind of playing into the same point mm. and especially if you're trying to model something we we encounter that issue quite a lot right where it's almost there's so much information that you could put in how do you figure out what exactly goes into a model because it's it's very easy for these machine learning models that are very advanced to just pick up on simple things that aren't really true um, and then you don't really have real performance you're not really predicting anything so we i think we're still trying to figure out exactly kind of how we bring everything in usually what we tend to do is you have to get really specific yourself and look and, and come up with hypotheses that you can mm. then go and test right i think this particular product does has this effect on something else and mm. go and look and and make sure when you've plotted it but it's definitely quite a challenge and but i i, I mean this is what i've loved working with you guys like the i the word science right is in like so my definition of science position engineering for me is in you kind of said it obviously but you start with a hypothesis and data science you you, you kind of validate that hypothesis to some hypothesis to some extent and then once you feel there's some traction it can actually be a product or support mm -hmm. a process then the engineering team need to form the data lake, need to create like streamline the processes and all that. And that's obviously the infrastructure behind what you've created. Uh, but you know, this it's, it's really enjoyable because you're literally just sitting it down, sitting down and saying, you know, what should, what should we think of? Like any scientist. Yeah. So um, that's been like hugely enjoyable. Well, just to touch on that really, there is, you know, that there's two ways you kind of can approach this, right? There is a, a business led approach mm. you know trade led is you know i think this about the markets i want it i think this i do this when i see this this happens and then there's also a data led approach where you go okay here is the data go look go go see yeah. if there is any interesting correlations mm. here right both have their their upsides um both have their challenges i mean with, with being a financial market it's so noisy there is and there and there are well it's not actually well there it is yeah it is noise right but it's it's not just raw noise it's actually a combination of all these other signals there are so many signals they just appear as noise until you start being able to understand it and unpick it which can make some of the data led uh, approaches kind of a bit noisy you'll overfit um mm. which you mean which as tom mentioned is basically you, you pick up on something that's not actually there you start to learn stuff by heart and and when you can apparently that's the cl most classic mistake the quantitative traders make so they come in and they and they say oh, there must be a I've seen this and seen that and they just they just dig down on it and then if you actually put the trade on you yeah. go through all the costs and all that it's it's nothing yeah. and it happens all the time apparently for the for the people who start in the market yeah yeah or, or you know you've got well I guess the, the the more common term in um I guess in quantitative is like back testing right it's kind of what we call right and it's it's making sure you're doing that I mean but the thing is so uh, sorry you're trying to, you're trying to spot these signals correlations whatever but then you want a good justification as the causation to really want to yeah, do exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. I think that's kind of been the secret, really. I guess evolving mm. past that is, okay, we can do, sometimes there will be data-led um, things or, or whilst maybe we're hunting down a hypothesis, something else pops its head up and we're like, okay, let's let's look at that. And um, But it's, it's kind of, I guess, some of the, the bid offer work, prediction work is kind of like, okay, what are the, you know, let, let's, let's, let's try and control ourselves 
to just features that we can have a have a you know realistic justification mm. for mm. um and obviously we're going to test them to see if they're true kind of like okay we yeah. expect it to you know the bid offer to widen based on volatility and, and obviously we do see that and we can quantify that mm. you know the size of the trade mm-hmm. and various other other positioning parts in the market right and, and what's going on in the surrounding project products now over over various time frames um so it, it's kind of if you can if you can relate it back it's a good way of keeping yourself disciplined because I think if you are if you're coming from a different market or different industry, you'd be like, "Well, I'm just going to throw the data at it," and usually you don't have probably even that, that much noise or something that was a much clearer signal, mm. a much easier problem, um, and it's fine. The data will more or less ignore the noise, and you know, nine times out of ten, unless you're doing something. But behaviorally, really it's really interesting as you talk because I, I one thing I do think about you guys is that you're not afraid of the lack of the answer, the uncertainty. So, you know, you, the classic quantitative trade or even, you know, a classic trade would just be like, look at the historical trades and sell the when it's historically high and buy when it's historically low. And that obviously blows out in times like 2020 or 2022. Mm-hmm. But I think with you guys, it's um, when you're like you're saying, it's you've maybe gone down a data led route or there's something data led and it turns out there's another avenue. You, you do not get frustrated by that, which is quite interesting. And I don't actually like that's probably a big part of data science. If you're going to get frustrated by the answer being elusive, almost like a false summit every time, mm. that's probably not the right behavioral skill set, right? The behavioral set for you to have in this. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, sometimes it's challenging, right? When you, you know, you're thinking about someone like you're working on a model and... Yeah. Because because obviously these things are relatively black boxes, right? So you do, you kind of, you know, trying to, you know, you're putting your, your instruments in to try and determine what the hell is going on. Mm. Yeah. Um, and it can be quite, challenging and sometimes you're just thinking oh, what why is happening you know like, <laughs> yeah um at time, i don't know if yeah you kind of, you we'll generally we'll have time. like a, a few ideas of how we want to model something and what mm. we think will be useful and you'll kind of cross them off as you go down the list and as you do that you'll come up with a few more and it's i think it's kind of one of the things you learn in data science is there isn't always an answer mm. and saying no this can't be done is just as useful as sometimes saying yes mm. but then we'll get you know you'll get all the way down this i think this has happened a few times right i've crossed off everything I wanted to do. And then you'll just have to sit there and we'll have to go out on a chat for about 30 minutes and be like, right, how are we kind of thinking about this wrong? Can we mm. swap this problem around? It's, it's like, what's what's the issue we have and how can we get around it? And specifically, if it's like bid offers, it was mainly because we didn't quite have enough trades. We were, you know, we were getting them in, we were cleaning them up. And after that point, we didn't have enough left and we were kind of overfitting again. So it's thinking, okay, well, how do we go and get either more trades or do we have to reframe this problem, right? Maybe we don't look at the trades. Maybe we look at prices instead because we know the traders kind of change the marks when um, they're about to make a trade. So could we look through that or can we go get more data from somewhere else? Can we combine lots of different products together if they look similar and kind of create a, a bigger data set that we can then work mm-hmm. on? So a lot of the time, yeah, it's almost, I, I find it quite fun to then try and reframe it because mm. you get to try something a bit different. You, well, I, it's just because for me, like, I don't want you guys to get frustrated. I don't want anyone to get frustrated when we're doing so. We're, we're here to do things, mm. right? And I think uh, the output, we had this discussion right at the beginning of the year. I think it was like, you know, we can say it's it's about making things commercial and that's one way to put it. But for me, it's like, like pulling out the value at each stage. So let's say you create the crystal ball one day. I mean, that's, you don't just spend all your time in a dark room until you get there and 20 years later, you come mm. out and say, I've got the crystal ball. There's all these steps along the way that can pull out value to improve decision-making internally, externally. We're trying to sell research at the back of this. We're trying to sell your data, right? To, to actually create value for the business. So that process, you know, it's it's not, I and mean, that's why we started the steering committee, right? That was the whole point of that, mm-hmm. which is to say like, you've done all this great work with thinking this thing, that. So just like your story there, Tom, it's like, so are there parts of that, that just by doing that work that we can pull out some value and say, look, just by this small type of analysis, that create that into a repeatable process that has value to be displayed and to be used in a research form used in a aiding uh you know decision making yeah you know I, mean? I think minimum as well we always kind of take it back to because sometimes you get a little frustrated but as long as we are learning about yeah. something very specific yeah it's like improved our knowledge for the next time we want to it might not be the next project but it might be in three projects time You're like oh right i've looked through all this data i know how it looks I know what to expect from it. And at least that's always like a win in some ways because we've kind of developed our own knowledge moving forwards. Yeah, I, mean, I think in terms of, you know, the real fun stuff uh, from a data science perspective, right? You know, 
most data science will, will love, you know, playing with these sophisticated models. You know, you've got your, your deep minds, your, your open AI and stuff like that. And, you know, that is the cool stuff, right? Mm. And, but, you know, there is a, those are, those are 200 man teams, mm. um, you know, with very significant resource budgets with nothing to do other than, and, and do that very it's, specific They're, they're happy being academics because. Yeah, but yeah. I, I guess it is kind of, you, I guess, you know, what, what is, what would be our potential strategic end state, right? It's potentially automated market making, mm. right? And and doing that with sophisticated models like reinforcement learning agents, you know, transformer back stuff. And it's, you know, but, you know, th there is so much that needs to go into that. I mean, if you just, like you say, if you just went and did that, you, you would be at it for years mm. and we will be at it for years. Um, but there's, as long as we're kind of chipping away and building the, the blocks to it. I mean, it's like kind of say, going back to your to the point around kind of, um, I guess more the not professionalism, but the industrialization mm. um, of the team that we kind of put into place over the yeah, last let's six months. Let's, let's go back then to the journey. So you come in, and the first thing was you know obviously learning, understanding that kind of thing. But the specific challenge I wanted to tackle up front was, you know, I had been spending a lot of time with the trader positions and done yeah the most basic of data science in the world. But at the same time, there was a kind of some form of process whereby the traders weekly were saying what they were seeing as hedging or speculative flow and um, if they could define that, how they're defining that and trying to estimate long short ratios and things like that. And then I knew it, was, it should be in the trading data. And that was really where, that was the proper first output work for you to, for you to tackle. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we need to go back, I can't even remember specifically, but do you remember how you kind of initially tackled that and how we went about it? Yeah, well, it's like I said, once we had the lay of the land and it was a case of, um, well, there's kind of the, the front end side of it, which is the analysis kind of more analogous to the data science side before we even had kind of like a data science team, really. Um, and it's kind of what are those teasing out those projects, right? And, and and the data points that we have and kind of we built those out into a rough, very rough project, uh, you know, product to looking back at it now, kind of the first attempt at a, kind of our commitment of traders dashboard, right? Yeah. It was, it was a completely different beast as to what it so is So we were now. saying, well, let's reveal the market's positioning formally, like all time. Yeah, and it was kind of, yeah, way. and how would you use this and kind of trying to package that into a product with a decent, you know, decision path through it. Yeah. Um, and I guess behind the scenes at the same time, right, we were we were starting to build out the data capability and infrastructure mm -hmm. behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And what, and I think the, the crucial thing um, about about how we did it was was that we did them both in tandem, yeah. Um, and we were to able to basically, you know, you know, rungs up a ladder each time. You know, we iterate the product side, and whilst we do that, then we're iterating the technical side, and we keep going and going and going whilst building the capabilities of the team as a whole. It's a great success story because I think most, like, if you if you're new to an area like this or technology or something, and and you don't know about it, but you know you need to be applying it. That first relationship is hunt. It's just so crucial. So, like you're saying, you're going up these rungs rungs but you know it could have gone so wrong we could have fallen out it could have just not really got each other and then you know you could have made a hire that was didn't go very well and these mm -hmm. kind of things so it really did have to it's quite high risk in a way right to get to each stage needed like an iterative process so yeah well it, well it's anyway, for example like if i turn if i turned up and said okay great but we need to do six months of engineering work you'd yes. be like what no man like <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's not going to fly or equally if we're just going to ignore that and say okay we've got all this data flying around there's a couple of databases that yeah. aren't in great shape yeah. and you know the data quality data quality is you know you know not great um yeah. and yeah. we build some you know you could never you could never have sold any of those mm -hmm. products those mm -hmm. first products we built but so. also i need to prove back to the board right back to well, what are we actually doing value. here yeah exactly and it was like, oh we're going to go into data science with one guy you know expensive and this kind of that was fine obviously yeah. you need to do it but how do you prove success and that is a behavioral thing, right? That always comes back to have you got the right people. And then that's why I quite like referrals as well. You two worked together before you bring in Tom. That I love that because you're trying to build on a known and reliable relationship mm -hmm. that's worked. So why rock the boat? And you know, yeah, it, it, it de risks the whole process de of hiring. The whole process. Yeah. Which which is the other which is the other challenge, I guess, of, of building the data team, right? It's the other core mm -hmm. part of it. Um is how Sorry, do you but just before you get to data, because that was yeah. a big part of it, but you need to get to the point where we could say, right, we want to keep investing in this because this yeah. is proven. And I think yeah, that's exactly, the point yeah. about like the lesson I'll always have to myself. And people get frustrated with this is you just have to, you have to release things or at least get something done for evidence. It's the MVP type style mm -hmm. mentality that's so popular in tech. Yeah. But it is true because unless people can see it and visualize it, they don't know what you're talking about. That's the whole point of having a vision, right? They yeah. can't see what you can see. So, you know, for you to do that with me was like a, a huge thing. So I would give you like unload a bunch of information. You wouldn't need to ask twice. So you clearly obviously had 
great capability for this. But then it was, I think the most poignant thing you did was actually, yeah, the, en the engineering, understanding all that, bring it together. But then you're not even a data visualization expert, but you created a dashboard that kind of visualized what I was talking about. And I think that alone was like, right, bang, that's it, right? Let's start getting, let's start getting the whole team in and let's start building this properly because we can actually sell off the back of this. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually gone from a conversation with a, um, I got uh, Miles, head of sales. Uh, he, you know, me and him were spending every day, all day speaking to clients, speaking to people, trying to, trying to get this product developed and I'm trying to define what the product was, a financial oil market research product. Um, and one conversation that was just like really knew that this was the right thing was I started to talk about the trader positioning and how to define it. I said, oh yeah, I've been waiting for you guys to do this. And like this, this is, this has been something that I thought you guys should do. And that kind of thing was like, okay, cool. So then we got the data set. And then the next one was, yeah, but what does this data mean? And what can it do for me? As I just, this, it just got to the point where it was, it was getting really frustrating. But then as soon as you created that dashboard, which very clearly showed longs, shorts and, it hasn't even materially changed that much no, even yeah, now. Yeah. Long shorts, like uh, the change in open interest, the market conditions and all this summarized. You say, look, I'm not going to tell you how to try. I'm not going to create a model for you, for you to go and make millions of. Why would I sell that? I'm creating a model for you to assist in your trading, to assist your decision making. But when you saw the dashboard and I would then go back to the same client and say, bang, have a, have a look at that. Like as part of your daily routine, it was it clicked. It clicked with the market. And it's been on a, like a still journey, a long sales process. But that's when I knew, right, this is the right guy. You've done a great job visualizing it. The data engineering looks good, but now you can't do it all yourself. Let's yeah. start, uh, let's start building out the team. So yeah, what were you yeah. thinking at that point? Yeah, well, obviously it was, yeah, that, I guess that's probably where it was quite so mental at the start, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, one man army. Yeah, and, then we, and we basically, yeah, started off um, growing the team first on the engineering side. Because you knew, right? You need to, there's so much data here. We need to just yeah. clean up the axis if we're going to have any chance. Yeah, you need to, you need to clean it up. You need to get it together, get it in a workable state. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you know, we, we could have brought Tom or, or any other data scientist in. It would have been wasting their time, really. Mm. Um, so, I mean, it was when did when did, when did you join last May? May? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that was a, that was a full it's a full year mm. that was of just doing. Okay, we did a few little bits of product productization on mm. on top of it. You know, the early dashboard prototypes mm. and stuff like that. But um, to kind of prove value, but um, the rest of it was purely engineering, really, mm. just kind of supporting, getting all the supporting foundations in place. And really the, that first foundation layer probably did take it, like I said, about a year mm. until we then, that was kind of like the phase phase one. Um, but again, see that year didn't didn't scare me because of what you create. I could at least go out exactly, and yeah. sell off the back of this and create something that yeah. didn't need to hold your feet to the fire for because it had had enough. The MVP thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, proving, proving value, right? Yeah. Like don't, don't ask for too much when you don't need to without, mm. you know, giving anything in return. Mm. Um, but yeah, that, then we kind of went out and um, started hiring, yeah, I could say the data engineering side um, and then followed by Tom was our first data scientist and where we now have, uh, we just taken on a new uh, graduate data scientist beginning of this year. So we're kind of still growing that team out. Um, yeah, it's a big team now. Yeah, it but is. Remember, remember, it wasn't just about hiring. So if you're going to do this, do it right. And that's what I'm saying. I guess this is a good story because mm. it was the Greenfield element of it made really clear. Yeah. Therefore, you knew at every step you had to think about a lot of different things in tandem. You need to have that mindset to be like, I know there's all these things we need to do. And that was always the conversation every so often. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I need you to do this, what do you need? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, this, 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 this in an yeah. ideal world. Or the, and, and that you've handled really, really well. But I think one thing that was a big moment as well was setting the kind of the business plan, right? It's not mm -hmm. just saying let's hire, let's hire, let's hire. It was let's imagine this is going to be a 50 man team and I don't know, person team three, yeah. three to five years. How exactly will you structure it? And a lot of it was like the values was actually you spent a lot of time on that. Like what are your internal desk, sorry, department values? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you guys have spoken about this before on the podcast, but yeah. So obviously we have the, the Onyx values yep. that are kind of core and then, but I, they are obviously they, kind of more or less come from you but i guess they come from a with a with the view of being in a trading organization right whereas mm. um i think tech, i would say more startup i would say more startup yeah, mentality sure, right sure. like the resilience to to the list and the resilience is get through it um you know that's easy for people to say but that's why we seem to hire a lot of people from army backgrounds because they actually understand what that means sometimes you need to grit and grit and grit and grit mm -hmm. and that's it and then the humility to learn people think humility means not being arrogant. I don't really mind arrogance, confidence, but humility means you're willing to learn off the person next to you and you're willing to know that you're not the complete article. And the accountability means stop blaming other people. Mm -hmm. So that those three, I don't think it's just trading. It's it's um 
it's got to have worked for you as well, right? In terms of the mindset, it's been consistent across the whole floor. I know what you mean though. It kind of might have a slight trading feel yeah, to it. So I, when you came to- Yeah, I kind of wanted to build a team with its with its own style and and kind of, yeah, like I say, values, right? The, the culture, right? And and um, we've worked hard to foster that. I mean, the, the values- what are your, your specifics? The, yeah, the, the, the three values, obviously mirroring the Onyx three is um, collaborative. Yeah. So kind of being there, again, kind of being there for each other, being a team. Um, you and know. why is that important? Because you guys are quite, it's quite, you know, you've got your headphones on and you're plugging away, right? So what makes the collaborative so important? Um, it is. Well, it's kind of, it's an interesting process. You know, you get stuck. Okay, you might need to bounce ideas off someone or, you know, you, can, you know, you basically want someone, you know, someone's got your back and, you know, and you're in a team the way you are a team, like you are, you know, basically, I guess, kind of from the military side of it, right? Mm. It's, you know, you're not just, you're not just five dudes working together. You're a team, mm. right? And that's kind of- I would say that's not common. That. You put that right at the top of your list. So why in a data science job, I think that was the, probably the last place I would think, right? Data and tech, they don't seem like the most, it's not as necessary to be collaborative. I'm, I'm really well, like that you're saying well, it well, is. Well, maybe that's where I think kind of a lot of, maybe a lot of tech teams do go on, right? You have, okay. you know, you have mixed, mixed perm contractor setups or yeah. kind of remote working yeah. and it's, it's hard to build, right? And yeah. And that's probably why some some teams aren't as functional. No, I love it. As, as I love it. I mean, you've created this but... team that you go you go to the pub every Thursday or every other Thursday, and like I know it's a small thing, but yeah. like no one else really does it so systematically and keeps mm -hmm. this team unit. And you obviously have this kind of consistency in your values because, like the humility thing, I see because like um, even though you can be an arrogant bastard, but the humility <laughs> thing is like uh, you will have someone just come across like Piri to the trading floor and blah, 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 blah. And then later on, someone said, yeah, Perry just came over and just like, just showed me everything he'd done. And basically when I asked for something two weeks ago, he just put it on my desk and went, yeah, there you go. And there was just nothing else said. And he wasn't making a big deal out of it. And it was just, you know, it might not seem like a big deal, but at the end of the day, the trading floor is very, is very like in, insular in the sense yeah, they always yeah, look at their yeah. screen. So for them to recognize something like that is, is really interesting, right? And it's not that common for people to just be so like humble in their process, even though they're doing really impressive things. And it's not just, it's not just training floor. I mean, Harry was saying the other day in Broking, like Piri's just got, he's just got this like relentless, like delivery approach. And he's like so nonchalant about it. And it's like really, it's really impressive because he's not, doesn't seem to be looking for like cheap validation. And one thing we used to get really frustrated with was cherry picking in business. That was one I, when I identified, we don't like cherry pickers to, you know, choose things to make you look good. And I think Perry is probably the opposite of that, right? But <laughs> yeah. obviously is that part of your values as well? Uh, well, that's kind of, I guess we picked that up from the, the humility side of the Onyx yeah. ones. But I think from the, the other ones we have is uh, be brave. Um, so kind of in your tech choices, I mean, it's something that you get quite a lot in tech teams, particularly with kind of, if you've got an old, I mean, we're, we're quite a young team as well um, in terms of age, um, you know, but you kind of have guys who've been in the industry for 20 years, but you know, tech moves, so quickly yeah. that the stuff you did beyond five to 10 years well, that ago. That was another thing. Actually, just, the recruiter was good on that. He said, if you, he was trying to identify what I needed and he was saying, if you go beyond someone who's had five years, they're going to have a lot of legacy beliefs. And I, exactly. I resonated with yeah, that. It's, it's legacy beliefs and also legacy knowledge. And, and, yeah. and yeah, I'm not saying it's not, not valuable, right? But it's, I think people can get some, if, you, if, you don't have, if you're not aware of it, you can get stuck in your ways, yeah. stuck in your views. Um, so it's kind of, being able to challenge yeah. your, yourself, trying to look for the- We've like swapped our tech stack quite a few times, right? Yeah, and it's like, you know, push Just yourself, be brave, check, go to the edge. Like, you know, we, you know, we work with with Microsoft and, uh, and Databricks are kind of our two main kind of suppliers, right? It's like, okay, tell me what's new. You know, show me what you've mm. got in private so you preview that isn't even public yet. Being like extroverted, being being assertive, being, is that what you mean? Yeah, well, be, 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 challenge, challenge your beliefs. Um, you know, put yourself, and it's uncomfortable, right? Challenging yeah. beliefs is uncomfortable. Yeah. Doing things that you don't know mm. um, and that you, you know, you're uncertain about is is uncomfortable mm. and be brave, be brave around that. You know, that's kind of what I was trying to encapsulate when we, when we set that. And how do you reinforce that? Um, I think you know, it's just, I, I think we're, we're now at such a point where we've got it more or less embedded so tightly. Because everyone else does it. Yeah, because yeah, we, we all do it. We, 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 I was actually we, remembering we was, what you said to was, me. It was, it was just that, um, it was just basically when it happens, you're going to make a point of it. And it's like, if you, if someone, had, you, you were basically talking about a time in your previous job where you had said something and, and they, they just didn't react well. And you just said, I'm never doing that again. Mm. And you wanted to create the opposite. You know, if they do do that and it does annoy you a little bit or whatever, you still encourage it because that's what, it, that's what you're trying to promote. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of like, you know, it, it's one of the, it's, it's a cultural thing, right? So it's got to be small bits and it, you got to obviously lead. Mm. as in you know, lead by example mm -hmm. and do it and encourage those behaviors and oh well, oh do, do you find that interesting good go go check it out mm. go, you know go tell me if it's something cool or edgy or but what about is challenging your beliefs 
like it's a hard thing for people to do. And again, it's the humility. And we used to call it what? Uh, what's that guy's name? Ray Dalio calls it like radical candor or ra radical feedback, radical transparency. And we have tried to promote that and the floor as well. We had it a lot more so uh, in the early days, like really being, you know, Omar, co-founder, like that's like his one thing. He is utterly brutal in what he thinks and what he will point out. Mm -hmm. But he, you genuinely know it's not emotional because he's he's actually trying to help you. So, but that's wrong though. And, and then you go back and it's right. It's, oh, that's great. So, you know, it's true, but a lot of people use feedback as a way to be cutting and the way to kind of have some kind of political crap, whatever. Mm -hmm. But you guys, it's it's a skill though, to be able to do this. So you obviously have that, right? I mean, how do you, if Tom was to say that's, that's just not right or whatever, you're, you're, you're not even thinking about it. You just think that's standard. Yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of like yeah. no, that's no, it's not going to work like that, or you know, you know, it, yeah, it's but, kind of it's just kind of. You know I'm saying people don't take that that well in some places. Your last place, yeah, for example, I, no. Or, um, well, or it's it's more it's more yeah. Well, well, the thing is, if you if, it, it's quite slightly different within our team the way we've built it, but um, I think in other teams, it, it, of course, if you are doing stuff in other teams, if you start to threat, people feel threatened, right? Yes, yeah. going to get those. So that's when you get these really visceral reactions. That's what I'm um, saying. Protectionism is like the death of innovation, right? Like exactly. It's exactly, everywhere yeah. in this it's industry. Like, oh, I, I don't know that. So I'm just going to be like, uh, no, this is me. And we're trying to create this big project. Yeah. Like, that's what you're leading. And like, if you had that. And, and you can do it. You just, yeah. you just need to make a conscious effort to do it. Right. right? And it's, and, and that's, that's more or less all, all, it, all it really takes is like, no, I'm going to make this happen. And having the discipline mm. um, to do it and keep chasing it. But I was getting more at like, not not hurting people's feelings, but you know how people can get when they get challenged. But if you're going to challenge each other and you're going to foster this yeah. high performance culture, that is so powerful. Yeah. We like, we make quite a lot of assumptions, I think, in our work. So it's yeah. quite, it's quite normal for one of us to just kind of come up and be like, well, maybe this is wrong. Maybe mm. you've assumed mm -hmm. this relationship doesn't actually exist. Mm. We especially get it with traders as well. The traders will just come in and be like, no, nope, that's not how that works at all. So then you have to, you hit it quite a lot. So mm. I think you get quite used to it, just constantly having to adapt and maybe sometimes we we don't quite fully commit to one particular assumption or one particular like way of thinking just because you know you might you might have been wrong in that and therefore mm -hmm. if you kind of go build too deep then you're going to waste quite a lot of work so we try and i think i guess it's kind of part of being the scientific process as well kind of especially on this side and on the science side it's like you know you, you are you're you're pushing stuff you don't know so by, by definition you might be wrong and it's kind of a you know working in data science is kind of and, and it particularly doing research kind of level stuff or you know touching on research level stuff um is you, that's part of the course and if you can't deal with that then probably not <laughs> not not the same <laughs> no. for you but that, that's so you're collaborative uh yeah collaborative uh brave, brave and yeah. uh curious as well curious yeah. curious yeah so i guess kind of leaning on kind of that same same yeah. element mm -hmm. right because it is it is so important is is do chase stuff down and the other thing was Permanent hires over contractors. Yeah. But again, fostering that collaborative nature, I guess, staying yeah. true to those those values. That must have been why, right? Yeah, and that, that's kind of the other, the other thing is, uh, well, we started off uh, with a contractor mm. um, more more as, as a risk, you know, financial risk thing, right? Yeah. As it could be, this was kind of very early days, right? Within the first couple of months, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it was kind of about de-risking that. Um, and I, and it, to be fair, it helped us understand what we did and didn't want, right? Um, and so, yeah, then we, we made the decision to basically only hire perm, basically. Um, not to say contractors. And you work oh, in the yeah. office a fair amount. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people yeah, wanna... We do work in the office. Yeah. So yeah. obviously that's something that we've transitioned from, mm -hmm. I guess we were roughly two days a week. Um, and I think there was more or less, a me there is a measurable difference between um, working two days and four days, for example. I think five days probably isn't necessary. I think we, we build up probably enough work mm. that we just need to sit down and get done, mm. you know, for the fifth day. Um, three days, okay. Two days, it's starting to take a bit of a toll. I mean, mm. there's a measurable difference because I've measured it, literally taken, logged it down of <laughs> of, of, of the interactions we That's have awesome. as, a, yeah. as a team. And they, they're significantly different. And it, mm. it's, it's amazing, like even the you know, technology, like teams being so, prevalent right it's it's still the act of saying you know can't just like yeah. turn around and just like oh i thought about that no, yeah yeah it's not worth calling someone about or even messaging them about but yeah, yeah. Kind of it's, it's amazing Quite often you'll just spot a graph on my on my screen or fred's screen and then that'll spark some sort of discussion yeah it's oh, how's, oh that looks interesting that looks that's cool, amazing you know, that's a collaborative like, thing yeah. again right it seems yeah. to be a really powerful 
I mean, value it, that. it even comes down to how we like literally physically how we sit in the office and how mm. even how the desks are set like up. Like a there. circle, right? Yeah, like kind of a, yeah. A, yeah. Rather than sitting um, facing each other, we kind of face back to each other. So we're basing in a big U shape, right? So we mm. can just turn around at any point in time and have the whole team there if mm. we need it. Right? Yeah. Um, and you know, these are small things, but they're deliberate, mm. I guess. And that's kind of all the things that kind of go to build build more of a, of a team culture, which has been, you know, probably one of the. I mean, personally, I think probably one one of the, my my proudest achievements, sit, you know, probably in my career, right, is, is building the team the way we have yeah, and awesome. and and how kind of how well performing we. So where do you see where do you see things going now, guys? I mean, obviously the the huge thing that people bang on about on every social media channel, AI, ChatGPT, is that annoying for you when you see all that, or how does it how does it feel? Yeah, <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom makes use of it, don't you? You use it, and you're basically in yeah. Your I'm not saying don't use it, but you know, time. everyone starts talking about yeah, yeah, your yeah. field now, and you're like, I think, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's on. a bit um, the chat GBT. I, I didn't. It's not too relevant to a lot of the stuff we we do. I think some of the technology underpinning it, we could probably start to apply. Mm. But yeah. Uh, I do have a particular graph of people telling me ChatGPT is going to take my job, <laughs> and then I try and like ask it questions, and it's it's only really good for like base level stuff. But isn't in general the AI push now? Yeah, I mean it's like you guys have been so, talking. Well, oh. obviously, I mean since it's been also been a step change since ChatGPT. Really, I mm. mean it, it it's an iterative piece of work, mm. but it's kind of the virality thing. It's just made it so mainstream, right? Um, I mean a particular bugbear of mine is the way people talk about it more in the media and stuff like that and i don't think it's particularly helpful what do you mean the extreme extreme arguments and yeah people making out wild outlandish claims and it just Skynet doesn't to yeah you know that's kind of, this kind of stuff or like it's going to take all our jobs and it's not it's just going to change our jobs it's like you know you could say the same thing about the light bulb or the internet right and it's you know it, it, it's probably not even as revolutionary as that maybe maybe someday it might be but um I mean, people have been making these outlandish claims, you know, for for the past five years or so, right? When you know these models were nowhere near capable of doing what they were doing. Um, you know, maybe you could argue they had foresight, but I think they're more just science fiction, really, that they were looking at. Um, but I think it's it's more productive to think about it. Um, it when you understand what it's doing yeah. and how it's doing it, um, it's not quite as scary. Um, you know, and and I think there will be. It was just going to change some things. It's going to make things more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, and in the context of oil, financial oil markets, what do you think the horizon, uh, or, or what are you excited about working on? I mean, you've got lots to unpack. I guess is what you were alluding to, Tom. Like, there's always something new to work on. But is there something in particular you guys are excited about, or is it just the growth, riding the growth? And because inevitably it will get more sophisticated. There will be more data science and algorithmic side of things. And, yeah, I mean, I think that one of the interesting is is taking it there. Yeah, um, there is so much to do and challenges to overcome. That are some of them are just a case of doing it. Some of them are quite profound challenges. Um, you know, and it's, it's knowing where you're positioned in order to have an impact on the market itself. Mm -hmm. Being here and having our trading volumes and our market share, and then being able to, as you say, take it there. That's actually what me and Omar said to each other a few years back. We're like, hang on, everyone's going on about starting platforms, they're starting this and that, and yeah. the market's going to do this. A, no one can figure it out, and B, if the people, if someone's going to do it, it should be the people doing all the trading, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess, we've extrapolated that out. Yeah, and it, mm -hmm. it's it's kind of it's, it's one of one of the interesting things about the all, all swaps is, like we say, it's so um, nascent, like verging on almost dark ages, kind of, you know, no, or no, you know, to to exaggerate. Um, but you know, it's it's not like um, you know forex or equities, right? They mm. are light years ahead, effectively. Um, and this is mainly because of the, the lack of digital trading. Exactly right. Yeah. And it, we think as soon as that become as soon as that comes in is and becomes mainstream, I don't think it potentially will be. And if it does, then that's probably a long way away. I think probably becomes a bit more blended as we kind of you can add. Well, this more is why I talk about in, protectionism but, when you guys talk about that, that protection is like stifling innovation. That's mm -hmm. that's the industry for you. We have, you know, a voice brokerage market that's huge, like massive and, uh, you know, big in the shadows kind of physical trade houses. And it's it's not an industry that wants to shout about itself mm. and um, embrace technologies. It's it's all about keeping it for yourself and getting that discernible edge. So that's it's the underpinning nature of oil markets that I think has yeah stopped it becoming. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, th well, that's one of the key things as well is is the, is, is yeah, pretty much is that, is voice brokered, right? And it's you know, OTC. So but it's not just the, it's not like I'm blaming broke. It's just like the the industry culture, right? Because yeah. at the same time, a lot. So 
all oil, oil markets, uh, physical oil markets, it's bilateral, right? It's mm -hmm. credit agreements and ISDAs and, and you don't have to report the transactions. There are physical transactions reported, but a tiny substrate of what's actually uh, traded every day. And that, I don't think, how can that change is to regulate the biggest market, commodity market in the world is, I just don't think, if it's not happened to now, I don't think it's gonna happen. Yeah, not so that, so all that data is just not yeah. there. Financial market is very different because you have recordable data. And since 2012, when the exchange started listing, exchanges started listing oil swaps, that's why we've just accelerated massively. But on the flip side, you know, physical oil markets um, probably never will, will mm. or at least are really struggling to, because no one really benefits from that. So that's what I'm saying, that, that kind of ethos is underpinning what you do, which creates its own challenge, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if we, if we, you know, go back to where do we think this is going? Yeah. Um, I think as we've seen over the last few years, it's things are getting more transparent. Yeah. Um, people are getting more, well, I don't say educated, but are more aware of of what what they can see in the data, mm. um, how the markets are behaving, even being even even giving a crap, right about. The, the financial side of it or on the swap side of it as opposed to no it's, I'm just supply and demand or mm. you know physical or whatever right and um, I think that's only going to continue and as that as we chip away at that transparency um, I think the date will only get more and more powerful um, you know obviously there's still things it's still largely brokered right but there's no you know in theory there's no reason why you can't have an automated trading algorithm interacting with a broker yeah. Right. These, you know, coming back to kind of what we're saying about kind of chat GPT, right? Is that could be in theory, if you make, take, make a, you know, a slightly more customized version yeah. of it, right? And, and specialized it, you know, you could effectively have that as part of a component in that chain, you know, basically going, you know, you've got your speech to text algorithms, you've got your market making algorithms, and you've got chat GPT doing speech, yeah, speech that, to text that, right yeah. into the model, right? And it's, you could, you can imagine a process like that. And that's, to be honest, it's probably not that far away. But someone's so got to do it. Someone's so, got to be bothered. This is kind of what I'm saying. Like, generally speaking, it's not like the tech hasn't been there for a long time to digitize the market. It's not like mm -hmm. AI is a new thing. But do people want to do it? And what's the actual benefit? And there's a lot of protectionism going on that was that will continue. So I don't. I don't know. It's. It's. I get what you're saying. If you looked at it at face value, you'd say I could see where this is going. Mm -hmm. But to take it there, like you said, is way more of a challenge than people realize. But I hope that's actually. A good thing for you guys. It's actually it makes it more interesting. Well, if you're the ones that can do it, then that's good. Yeah. Nice. Otherwise, yeah. you just get Google just coming into the market yeah. and be like, right, we run the market yeah, exactly, now. But that's right. not going to happen yeah. because there's a lot of domain knowledge that you said to learn the language, to learn the complexities, and invest the time. Like, why even be bothered? You need a plan. You need a return on investment. And that's what I was saying about the trade houses, majors. Like, millions and millions and millions been spent, but their return is trying to get better models, right? Or or at least streamline their data. Like, mm. I've heard the complaint from multiple different. Um, uh, majors and trade houses are saying we should have the best physical data in the world but you know we've got stuff that's on photocopied sheets of paper like how yeah, am i gonna yeah. i might be cdo of this place or i might be head of data or, but what do you want me to do like <laughs> yeah, yeah. how do i how do i get all this as actual data which is the upside of you know platform software digital markets because it's just so easy to collect the data you try doing that on physical you can spend all the money in the world they'll probably never get there Mm. Um, and that, that is what it is. Or if they were to, so let's say they're doing some big 10 year project, is it really worth those 10 years and all that investment? Like what is the end goal? Because by mm. that point, if you ask me where I think it's going, that supply and demand data, ship tracking, it's so saturated, like, and there's so much like M&A activity. Like at the end of the day, everyone's seeing the same thing now. Mm -hmm. It's It's just, I don't see how that research doesn't just, or that data doesn't just plummet in value because if everyone's got it, like why, that's just the Price definition anyway. of, yeah, exactly. It. As, long as, as long as everyone else, but you, who's got it, it's fine. But I'm saying, how does it not get out? It's just, a, it's just an economic thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've got these, these agencies that start up or these data firms that start up and they get bought and they keep starting up and they keep getting better and better. And in order to start a business and, and get sold at a high valuation, you need to create something new. So yeah. there's this big fight for creating the next thing, which obviously creates innovation, but it, it's gotten to that point. It's so saturated in that. And isn't, is there anything else you can really do? Like if you speak to Miles, talking to, telling you stories about like um, the crazy things people do to get data on refineries, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like tracking wires and, and tracking activity, power activity to yeah, see how yeah. much power is going through mm -hmm. the refinery to judge the yields, all this kind of stuff. Like yeah. I go on and on and on about it. But the point is, is that I only see that becoming like almost like high frequency traders, that millisecond edge. And what edge are you talking about when you relate it to the financial market? It's an entirely different market. Yeah. So 
Well, I guess that's kind of one of the things with, with us, right? Is you know, if, if you've got to believe you're in the right. Yeah, name. well, when, and then you've got well, like I say, you've got to keep innovating, right? Those those things you just mentioned were innovations at some point in time, yeah. but then they become democratized or yes. at least disseminated. And the same thing will probably happen with our data. I yeah. mean, do you want to be the person who doesn't have it? Well, probably not. Yeah. But then it's it's going to be up to us to say, okay, how do we keep innovating this? How do we, you know? And that's why proprietary data is so important, right? Yeah, it kind of gives you the it gives you the the start. Right. It gives, every, it gives like, you the USB, it's not a new but, thing now. It was a new thing last year. Now it's not so much of a new thing. Research agencies and companies are trying to look at the financial markets, but they can only look at the CFTC commitment of traders report. Mm-hmm. That's the only public available data on um, available. Uh, but we've got our own version with our own trading. And that's obviously that's why we know it's valuable. And that's what we've got available for market. Uh, but that that's a huge deal, right? Without if you've got if you're just going to look at the same thing, like Again, it's that could get democratized like, really, really, really quickly, you know? Yeah, it's kind of worth it. Um, yeah, but I think, I mean, to be honest, I think even our data, whilst it would, you know, you can get read on everyone's positions, right? It's, you know, if someone were really, really, really wanted to do it, maybe they could, but it would be probably phenomenally expensive. But, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm working, you know, under an assumption where kind of, People understand the value of knowing where the market's positioned, right? And that gets disseminated, right? So it's kind of like, okay, what else, what else comes on top of that? And that's yeah, why, right. What's the next you know, thing, it's yeah. kind of, um, but that's why, you know, the, the, the data, the team that we've built here, right, isn't just a data engineering team because how is the market positioned? It's more or less an engineering problem. It's just get data from here, clean up a bit, get out of here, right? So it's it's a combination of, of capability um, and, and value add as well as the raw data itself. And, and that kind of serves, so, you know, two kinds of product sets, right? You have you know, very sophisticated clients, right? Who, you know, would just give me the data. But a bit like ways, we, if we were taking, pro, you know, data yeah. products and we'd just be like, okay, cool, man. But like, we're at least going to check and take, we're not just going to take your word for it on these models and these outputs. We, we'd want to know and, and build this stuff ourselves. But then we also have, you know, people who don't really care or don't have the capability to do that and mm. kind of provide that insight on top. So um, what do you think when you say, because you guys have consultancy backgrounds and isn't there that classic line, which is what is the why or? or? Yeah, roughly it's kind of, um, you know, it's it's kind of what is the so what? The so right? what? Yeah. So what, you know, from a service perspective, we're understanding more and more like Onyx's position is so what to the market is, you know, for it to get on market access, right? Like as in everyone from retail institutions, professional, of course, if we're trading the smallest kind of bid offer you can trade, mm-hmm with the shells, the BPs, the trade houses, all that, if we can trade with them at this bit offer, we, why don't we give access to everyone with that? That's kind of the journey we're on with the services, with the data. So that's to say, is your so what, is that how you feel? It's like you're figuring these things out and you're adding values, value to people with the so what in mind being trade more, right? I mean, at the end of the day, or yeah, have more kind, confidence well, that kind of gives, it gives a bit of a feedback loop, yeah. loop as well yeah. anyway, right? But it's serious. Yeah, I guess it. I guess the way we always used to ask it was kind of okay. I can tell you this interesting thing, and and that's I think kind of when we when we are developing mm. products, and you know we can even train. We don't go as far as training sophisticated models to predict stuff, but if no one cares about the prediction, <laughs> then well, well done you. Um, you know, as an academic pursuit, yeah. fine. Yeah. But um, as as a because a commercial pursuit, and it, it, that's it's not going to fly. Um, and I think that's probably something interesting to call out is. Is you know I guess is, as a as a juxtaposition to kind of um, a lot of consultant data science work is um, is is that that pro- productization right? It's mm. not just oh slam power and MVP. Yeah, you could do this. This is cool. Blah, blah, blah. Or like, you could do this with GPT, Prompt this. Blah blah. It's like no, but like how do we take that from 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 some model and make it into a usable product that will provide value to to our customers? Or, or to the business internally, and I think that's something that's mm. it's it's heavily slept on, um, or just not even seen as a, as a as a complete zero. And that's that's pretty much fifty percent of the game, yeah. really. I've I've been a professional data scientist. It's such a huge component, um, and all the skills that go into kind of working with with you, like Tom, when you're working with the yeah. traders, right, and 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 pulling that and teasing out these kind of use cases and values. Yeah, um, it's kind of we always think it's like one side of the project is what can we do but then what's useful and it's like what's that tiny little bit in yeah. the middle that covers both bases right and and sometimes it's a case of okay well we know we want to look so like refinery margin right mm. which we're kind of doing some work on now kind of working on that it's like okay well we can work out all this stuff and we can even predict you know you know upcoming flows to a reasonable level of accuracy it's like okay but 
how do you use this? Mm. And sometimes you have to be quite creative yes, around the application. Absolutely. It's like, okay, well, if, if we frame it like, if we frame it in this slightly different way, then all of a sudden, then that's, it's a freaking gold mine, like, you know, or, or you if you frame it in a different way, way, it's completely useless to everyone. Yeah, right? it's so funny how you never know what people are going to do. Mm. Sorry, what people are going to find useful. Like some very specific thing yeah. you've done, you're like, I didn't know. Why does people care about that? <laughs> but that's, that's the game, isn't it? Like you say, mm. that's the client feedback. I mean, this is technology. You talk about this all the time, right? You need to speak to clients. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and kind of complete that loop. I mean, I think one of the other things that we've done recently as well is we've, um, with, with all the infrastructure we've built, we've actually, um, rolled it out to the trade floor. Mm. Um, so now all the traders have access to all of our data. We've trained all the, all the juniors and some of the seniors. I love uh, that. And so day one, you come in, you get trained. You don't know any different. Mm. You're yeah. creating that next generation of like yeah. data empowered, you know, really empowered with the knowledge of how we look at markets, the philosophy, and then obviously how to trade. Yeah, I love the way that's going. And it's and, great. and and well, the the benefit from a day, from a for for our side, right, is it completes the data cycle. Yeah, yeah right. So yeah. so now you have, you know, because a lot of our you know the pricing sheets, or whatever, like kind of feeds into kind of one of our primary data sets. But yeah. it's like okay, but you need to, you know, if they can see it effect impacting the stuff they're doing now, then then it, and also get some, it, you, know, you know, that kind of completes that and it improves data quality, improves feedback, yeah, uh, and you know, and it gets them thinking about it. Right. And, and also chat, I think probably we maybe have to ask them, but kind of sometimes, certainly some of the juniors challenging their beliefs because they're, they're the ones going in and, and looking at this stuff. So, oh, no, I've been told this. It's like, mm. Okay, but have you gone and looked yeah, at it? Yeah, yeah. Have you actually gone see? Because that's something that we get quite often, right, is, mm. is um, you know, we'll go talk to the traders and be like, well, this, or even even sometimes with yourself, mm. it's like, oh, well, I think this and this is what, okay, but like. Actually, this is what. Well, actually, well, we, yeah. went, we, went, we went to look for it mm. um, and we couldn't find it. Um, or we found something different. Um, and either that either means that the hypothesis was not explicit enough or there's something oh and it's not to say you were wrong as well but it's kind of maybe there is maybe, no there's, wrong, right? maybe there's something exploration. else yeah. maybe there's something else going on yeah that it's completely dominating no, this, I right and it. it's like I love it. there's, there's all this kind of stuff but it's yeah it's kind of completing that cycle has also been another big big step forward for us as well i think if i had to just say this last two years the journey i thought to be honest yeah like you say i didn't realize how much work it would be of course to some degree but it's also, I thought it would be more solvable because mm. at the end of the day, you've got all these contracts that are linked and you can account for all those flows. So why is it, it's so difficult. And I think you mentioned it, like because there's so many different signals, when you compound those signals, the noise that you get is so hard to unpack sometimes. You yeah. can only work through it and it'll be an endless task. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and as you said, there's, you've never seen a market that's got so many correlated Yeah. Uh, what would you call it? Like curves, I guess. Yeah, prices. prices time mm. series. Yeah, that's that's probably it in a nutshell, right? There's just so much correlation that when you have all these disparities and different different behaviors, completely different traders doing different things independently mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on all these different curves, and you compound them all together, that's that's why it's so complicated, right? Yeah, and yeah. And, it, and it's it's complicated from as almost like from a conceptual level, and then even to working with it technically, yeah, yeah. It, is is tricky. Um, obviously. There are some tools that we we yeah. use to do that, but it's why we don't really get that scared about the kind of chat GBT, right? Because we have to <laughs> specifically go in and be like, you know, I, I think the price of yeah. naphtha is yeah, driven yeah, by yeah, gasoline, yeah. then I have to go. You have to look at it. Okay, it's true in this in this window, but you can't just chuck some yeah, big sure. model at it. Sure. Yeah. yeah, guys, it's been super fascinating, and uh, yeah, I knew it would flow, and uh, just really really interesting. So, I think you're going to be putting some stuff out on LinkedIn as well, aren't you? About yeah, yeah, we have to come kind of. Uh, We've got that coming out soon. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of talking about more specifics around kind of working with uh, the difficulties and challenges of working with all swaps data and, and kind of the ways that we've kind of overcome those challenges and, yeah. and the avenues of research that we're looking at and kind of mm -hmm. just touching on that just as a high level. But uh, yeah, that's should be hopefully coming out soon. So yeah. great. Well, thanks very much for your time, guys. I'll let you get back to it. Great. And uh, so yeah, for the listeners out there, I hope you enjoyed it. It's slightly left field, but super super interesting, I think. And uh, Please tune in next week for more. Thanks again.